Welcome everyone. I'm Tina Whitman, Science Director here at Friends of the San Juans. Thanks for joining us at this Lunch and Learn to talk about shoreline armoring. Today we're going to talk about a recently completed um, marine shoreline armor project. It involved field mapping, a 10-year change analysis, and also a regulatory review. Um, before I get started on that, I just wanted to just give a little highlight for those of you who don't know us, and I recognize many of the names on the um, Zoom, but for those who aren't familiar with Friends of the San Juans, we're a public service environmental nonprofit organization. We've been in the county since 1979, and we work to protect and restore the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea for people and nature. We were formed in 1979 by a group of um, citizens concerned about um, very expansive development happening in the county at that time. So again, we're gonna talk about this project that we recently completed. And before we do that, um, I wanna do a land and water acknowledgement. Friends of the San Juans honors the salmon, orca, and all of the plants and creatures on the land and in the sea that make the San Juan Islands and the Salish region unique and significant. We respectfully acknowledge that this beautiful place we strive to protect and restore is comprised of the ancestral lands, waters, tangible and intangible resources of the Lummi, Saanich, Samish, and other Coast Salish peoples. The tribes have cared for and stewarded the Sam on Islands and the Salish Sea since time immemorial and continue to do so today and we honor their inherent Aboriginal and treaty rights that have been passed down from generation to generation. And we recognize our responsibility upholding treaty rights entered into by the leaders of our sovereign nations. Um, and as you can see from these great graphics that Elise put in, um, we are in an area that has historically and still has today um, lots of um, indigenous tribes, which is really part of our rich um, ecology and culture here. Okay, so switching gears to the meat of this. So before we talk a lot about the details of the study, it's important, right, that we all get on the same page of what are we talking about when we talk about shoreline armoring? Um, so when I say armoring, we're referring to the hard structures that are built on a beach, um, typically at sort of the bank beach interface, sometimes way out on a beach. Here in the San Juan's typically kind of right at the bank toe. Um, they can be concrete. They can be wood, they can be creosote wood, they can be large rock, small rock, or some sort of combination. Um, but the idea is that they're built along the shoreline, um, shore parallel, and with the goal of stopping erosion, right? And trying to sort of keep land in place. Um, and this is some photos of some typical looking seawalls, bulkheads, riprap, armor. It's a lot of different terminology for some reason in the San Juans or in Puget Sound. Um, we typically use the word bulkhead, um, but I just wanted to kind of get us all on the page of what we're talking about today. We're talking about the hard stuff put out on to our marine shorelines, our beaches, with the goal of stopping erosion. And again, so now we're sort of all on the same page of, of what is armor, and then the important piece, right, is why do we care? Why do we spend two years doing a study like this? And the science, you know, is is gaining. And really now there's over the last two decades probably has been a lot of science that is very clearly demonstrating the real impacts that hard shoreline armoring does have on our natural shorelines. So at the most basic rate, what, what it's intended to do is to disrupt the sediment supply process, right? So those bluffs that are eroding, and that's our primary source of sand that's maintaining and forming our beaches here in the San Juans. We don't have large rivers contributing lots of sediment like other places in the world. And so armoring just stops that, right? We're trapping the sediment behind. And over time, you can see starving of the beach ahead of that. So you'll get a coarser beach, less fine material, um, a steeper beach. And then a lot of the work that's been done um, lay, led in part um, by Megan Dietier at Friday Harbor Labs with a whole host of graduate students over the last couple of decades right here in the islands and across Puget Sound have shown also that places with this armoring bulkhead seawalls have less shoreline vegetation. I um, you got to clear it away, right, to make a place to put to build this structure. It changes the beach microclimate. So if you think about it, there's this big rock wall on the beach and less vegetation, then in front of that wall, it's gonna be hotter and drier. 
that leads to forage, lower forage fish egg survival. They've shown that surf smelt egg survival is reduced by half if there's armoring at a beach. Um, forage fish are a key part of our marine food web, so that's obviously a concern. Um, and then just the whole food web. So there's less seaweed or what we refer to as rack, sort of the washed up seaweed on beaches that have armor, less large wood, and less of a lot of the different smaller critters that are there. And that matters because these things are part of the, again, that base of the marine food web, providing the insects and invertebrates that juvenile salmon and other marine species are eating. So again, armored sites are really, the intent is disrupting sediment supply. We end up with biological impacts, physical impacts to the character of the beach, um, less food for juvenile salmon, and less resilience to sea level rise. So a natural beach wants to move and adjust landward as sea levels rise. Um, and if there's a hard structure there, that's just not possible. In contrast, natural beaches have a sandier profile, less steep, more overhanging vegetation, um, easier for landowners to get to, right? Better forage fish habitat. And this is, it looks kind of messy, right? It's sort of not that neat, tidy, lots of people use armoring as a landscape feature versus an erosion control. Um, so it is sort of a, a different aesthetic, but it does have a lot more biological function. So again, starting at this project, and there are multiple phases of this project. So um, the first phase was an actual boat-based go out and do a survey from a boat, not on everyone's property, um, but from offshore of where all the hard shoreline armoring is in San Juan County. This was done by a small boat with multiple people on the boat, sort of trained staff. And actually we had two of the three people were the same folks that did our 2009 beach survey. That was also boat-based. There's standard state methods. Um, so you do a field survey, and then we're um, creating, if you can look here and see sort of on the right, we're creating some maps of where new armor was versus where armor was when we last mapped in 2009. So step one of this project was go out and do it in 2019. What is happening on the ground? Where is shoreline armoring? So the cool thing was, and I just referenced that we had an earlier study from 2009 that had done the same thing. Now we have a beginning and sort of this 10 year period, right? And so then we were able to compare our 2019 results with 2009 and do a change analysis. And I'll be going through all these steps. I'm just sort of doing the big picture here. So mapping, then the change analysis of what happened, what, how much armor came in or out in that 10 year period. And then again, because we have this 10 year period and we know that the rules apply since 2009, right, that you have to get permits for armoring on beaches, we were able to do a regulatory investigation, basically, looking in for permits and at permits of all the new armor that had been installed in that 2009 to 2019 period. And again, just some examples, you can see sort of an example on the top right of what the maps end up looking like. There's the, a photo that gives you an example of what our images look like. So we're able to compare the imagery from the two different time periods and also those field surveys. Um, and then the most important part of this, right, is sort of what are the management implications? The whole goal of this project is to provide sort of objective information that can help us really decide where do we need to make tweaks to our protection policies or how we implement them. And here's um, a results slide. And so this is sort of, will show results in a couple different ways, but so all the yellow dots, or all the places where there was armor when we mapped in 2009 and armor again when we mapped in 2019. So we call that existing armor, right? That was there. All the red dots are places where we found armor in 2019 and we hadn't mapped it in 2009. So that got categorized as new armor. And then all those blue dots are the places where armor was removed. So we found it in 2009 and in the 2019 survey, we did not find it. And a bunch of these, about a third to a half, are actual restoration projects done by friends and the land bank and other organizations. And then some of those are things like, you can sort of imagine many of us have seen sort of like the tide log on a beach. Some of them are things like that that are just gone now. And we can tell because we have the pictures from 2009, right? And then we go back and there's nothing there. Um, so this is sort of the results of our change analysis. How much existing? 25 miles. 
how much new, almost two miles, how much removed, a third of a mile. And just looking at that in a different way, and again, getting back sort of to the why of this, is that you know the planning department unfortunately sort of has to mostly just look at a parcel by parcel right someone applies to get armor and we're always sort of focusing on the details of this one little site it's really important to take the time periodically to sort of zoom back out and see okay what's going on so we know shoreline armor has negative impacts to habitat we know that we've got improved regulatory and voluntary programs to help address the armor so what's our trend looking like and unfortunately, we see that we're still really heavy on the newly new armor going in versus armor removed, right? We're trying to get this closer to zero, sort of, you know, just as much coming out as being put in, or ideally, if we want a net gain in habitat, more coming out through restoration than is going in new. And I do want to note right now that all armor, um, some armor is necessary. In some places, you can't take it out. Um, it's not feasible. Development is too close. Erosion risks are too high. Think about our ports and our ferry terminals and, and things like that. And so I, it, this is also sort of, I just want to be acknowledged that this is a realistic look at this, right? We are not advocating for all armor to come out um, or for no new armor to come in. That said, we still see armor going in in places where it's just unnecessary. We have relatively low erosion rates. In many places, houses are very far back. I talked earlier about people do them as a landscape feature. And when we know they have so many negative impacts, that's just not appropriate anymore. So again, big picture trend. Um, unfortunately, much more coming in than being removed. Okay, so now we've done the mapping in 2019, field-based mapping all how much armor in San Juan County. And we've compared that, we've done our change analysis for that 10 year period, 2009 to 2019. So now for those new sites, slightly over 100, I think 108, new armor, just those sites, because we know they were in the window of the time period where they needed a permit, we then did a regulatory review that had two key steps. One was how many sites had permits? Basic compliance, right? Everybody needs a federal and a state hydraulic permit um, and possibly a, a federal permit. Um, so we did a state and local um, analysis of this. So we did just county and state um, because only sometimes does the federal jurisdiction come into play. So question one, compliance, how many people had permits? And then question two, for those sites that did have permits for those new armor installed in that 10 years that did go through the permit process, we did a deep dive into all the reports and looked at what can we learn from how this process went? Are there tweaks that might need to be made or is it working great? Um, so it's sort of a two-part regulatory review and I'm gonna split my results in the two parts as well. So these first results, compliance, um, and as someone who tracks um, shoreline development in San Juan County very closely and also spends a lot of time in the field on shorelines, um, and I have for the last two decades, I was even surprised by these results um, that sort of how much still um, is going in without any permits. So we had about 74% of the projects went in without a local or county permit. Another 17% were partially permitted. And what we called partially permitted was they either had the state permit and no county, they had the county and no state, or if they had both, they got both after they had already installed, right? And after the fact or as a result of enforcement. Um, and only 9% were fully permitted by state and local authorities before they were being constructed. So take home compliance problem, right? Um, in terms of just coming in the door to get permits in the first place. So, and then the second part of this, that was sort of our compliance results. And then the second part, which I call sort of regulatory effectiveness, right? So we have this regulatory process, it's really intended um, and it's quite well written, I think in our shoreline master program, It if, Everybody followed that right to the letter. We would do a good job, I think, of determining which ones are really necessary 
And is it the smallest that possible to meet the goals of the landowner um, and minimize impacts to habitat, right? So that's sort of what our regulatory system is supposed to do. This is where we determine, are there cultural resources that need to be protected? Are there environmental resources? Are there impacts to neighbors? Um, and sort of all the host of um, different various sort of rules that go with the state and the county permit process. So we made this huge massive spreadsheet, looked at all these permits um, and basically tried to analyze, okay, how's it going? Even if for the folks who do come right through the front door for the permitting process. Um, and this is just a summary of kind of what we found. Um, again, this is across county and state. And these are sort of the major trends. Um, again, we have sort of site specific information on every permit and every site, but this is sort of the, the, the what was sort of the stuff that seems important and that was consistent um, across. Um, so one is that there was just very limited um, evidence um, in the permit record. And that's a really great point that I want to make right here, actually, is that this analysis is as good as the permit record is. And so if there were 50 site inspections, but nobody ever wrote down that they did a site inspection, we don't know that they did the site inspection because there's no record of that, right? There's no, we didn't interview the landowner or things like that. We did a very detailed public records request multiple times with the county and the agencies and made sure we got sort of all the documentation. Um, that we could, but again, we're working with what we have. But again, and I, and I think this holds true, and again, we've been speaking with the managers and, and the different agencies, and, and folks aren't surprised by this either, but because um, there's capacity issues as well, right? But there was very limited evidence of doing any sort of inspections um, or coordinating amongst the different permit agencies, like the state and the county working together, or the state and the county and the feds working together. Um, and where we did see those, it was violations or those after the fact permits. Another trend is that there was very little mitigation. So mitigation is basically say, you absolutely must have a bulkhead to protect your structure, but you're building on a forage fish spawning beach. Well, then you better be doing something, right, to either enhance the habitat at that site or another forage fish spawning site. Um, so again, very little evidence that that was required and no evidence in the record of mitigation ever being implemented. One positive thing, one positive trend that I really do want to note, because um, this is different than I think if we'd done this study 10 years ago, is that some of the unauthorized armor is slated to be removed. Um, now, it's a really slow process because as of about a month ago, none of that armor had been removed yet um, because they're sort of in the long planning process to do that. But it is really a positive that some of the unauthorized armor that is making it into the enforcement process is actually being slated to be removed. So that's a positive. Um, and then another thing we found, and this we were definitely expecting, um, but that these consultant reports are really a sort of cookie cutter. Sometimes they even have the wrong landowner name or the island, right? So you can tell that they're just sort of point, um, you know, cut and paste um, for the next report for the next site. But Across the board, basically all of them concluded no impact or no net loss. The exception would be as if it was written for an after the fact one where part of it was coming out. And then they would acknowledge that that had had an impact and that, the, that they were gonna make it better by taking it out. But for all new armor going in, basically all across the board, it was just a blanket, no impact. And again, getting back to these impacts, right? This is why we care. Um, about armor, right? We, it's not just sort of something to keep us busy. It's, it's armor has no negative impacts to our sediment supply bluffs, to our forage fish spawning beaches, to our pocket beaches that are used by forage fish for spawning and also by juvenile salmon that are out migrating. And what we see, and these are places that are specifically sort of called out by the science and also the policy and the rules as these are places that need better protection. We are still seeing new armoring going in at these places. So that's, you can look at sort of the big trend and then you can say, well, did it get better at these priority areas? Um, or are we still seeing impacts in those areas? And unfortunately we are still seeing impacts in these areas. Um, I will note though, that for feeder bluffs and forage fish, less authorized impacts in these areas, right? Only 62 feet and that's the same structure um, was allowed 
um, through the permit process, but we still see a lot of um, impacts happening through the unpermitted stuff. Um, and I'm going to stop here because I see that there are some questions in the chat. All right, so um, Randall, great question about what is limited evidence of mitigation. Um, and basically that's, um, so I think it was about 40% of the state permits had some sort of mitigation required, whether it was that people do replanting or beach nourishment or some something like that. So that sort of, um, and then there were very, very few cases in the county level um, where habitat mitigation was required. And so that's sort of the, the limited is that out of all of them, you know, way less than half um, and certainly more down probably to the 10 to 20% if you include county and state permits had mitigation. Um, and then um, in terms of actually information on how the mitigation went or if it was ever implemented, zero information in the record. Um, so that's a case, and that may be a case, they may have all implemented and it may be going great, and it might just be a case of not putting that information in the permit record. But again, if we're going to try to sort of check in on ourselves and see how are we doing, how's the Shoreline Master Program doing at protecting shorelines, we've got to start collecting that data. Tina, there is one additional comment that I'll read from okay. uh, Grant Novak. Uh, the state mandate is for no... Uh, the state mandate is for no net less of ecological function. A project cannot move ahead if there is a net loss. Therefore, a no net loss report must show no net loss. So of course, all NNL reports show no, no net loss. <laughs> Many projects are designed to avoid impacts and or be self-mitigating. Yeah, so Grant, that's a great point um, that that conclusion at the end um, is sort of that is the requirement, right? So of course, everyone's going to come to that conclusion. Um, and that is a really good point. I should have clarified more. So despite, um, you know, we saw projects that were building a structure down to mean higher high water, which is much farther down the beach than the bank toe. Um, and, you know, 300 feet long, and that one had no that loss. And then we'd see one that was like little and smushed way back where they were adding nourishment and vegetation. And then that one was, of course, no that loss, right? So sort of regardless of the project type, whether it was at a spawning beach, where it was on the beach, regardless of the whether it's a feeder bluff or not, sort of it, it didn't seem to matter. There just always was the sort of conclusion of no that loss, um, even if there was what seemed like very clear to us sort of direct burial of a very low structure or at an actual documented spawning site um, with no mitigation proposed, right? So it was just, it's, it's very blanket. Um, so not only is it, I guess it would be the no net loss analysis piece is kind of missing. There's sort of a conclusion without sort of the required analysis to support that conclusion. Thanks, Tina. And then uh, an additional question from Dan. How will designation as a national monument affect permitting and enforcement? Yeah, so that designation actually happened back under the Obama administration. Um, and I don't think that that has had, um, I mean, it probably has had implications on those monument lands, but not off. Um, a few changes that have happened, there's been a um, biological opinion um, issued by NOAA and NIMFS, and also there was some litigation with the Army Corps of Engineers about how the Seattle district was interpreting the high watermark in its jurisdiction. So both of those things, I, I think, are combining that in the future we'll see more federal participation and regulations related to armor. So if, say, if we did the study in 10 years, um, we would probably look at county, state, and federal permits. Um, but since there were basically no and or very few federal permits in this time period, we didn't look at it because we didn't feel like it would give us any trend information. Um, but yeah, good question about the federal role. Okay, so getting to the sort of what does it all mean, right? What are, and that's again back to sort of why we do this, is sort of how we, how can we sort of drive what we need to do better um, if we're gonna work on protecting these shoreline habitats. So, and again, these are sort of organized by compliance of did people get a permit at all or are they happening outside of the whole regulatory window? And then we'll talk in, in a minute um, 
about sort of the people that the permit process itself, the management implications for that. Um, so this first one, and I think the very most clearest thing is that we actually have to pay attention to what's happening on the ground. Because um, if you don't have an armor survey that shows that nearly two miles went in and 75% of it was unpermitted, um, right now, a lot of the agencies just look at, you know, when we monitor our impact under the Shoreline Master Program, and we monitor our impact towards taking out armor, people are looking at the permit record. And so what this shows, the study in San Juan County shows, and other work in King County and, and over on Hood Canal has shown is that if you just look at the permits and not what's happening on the ground, you are missing a big part of the picture. And that has implications for everyone, right? A, it's not fair for like the landowner that goes through the front door permit process, which is long and expensive and complicated, right? We won't lie about that. Um, and, but so there's no, you know, kind of you need the sort of incentive. And then also it's certainly not helping the habitat. And we don't have a clear picture of how restoration is helping us. Um, are we able to get, you know, a net gain in habitat because we've done so much restoration that and protection is holding the line, right? But this is really showing that we've got to do a better job of what's looking at on the ground. Um, and that leads to the second one, which is that code enforcement systems, which in San Juan County and in most counties um, is complaint driven, right? There's not the resources for folks to go out and monitor, to be proactively looking, um, but that has implications, right? That means that we don't catch most of the violations, especially here in the islands. Like you don't drive by people's shorelines all the time from the ferry or pretty far away. It doesn't go everywhere. Um, so there's just a huge a number, right? 75% of these projects um, are happening totally outside. So not only did they not come in the front door for the permit, but they also aren't getting picked up by the enforcement system. Just six of the roughly 75 unauthorized bulkheads in that 10 year period were picked up by the enforcement system. Enforcement is slow, right? It's time consuming, it's a long process. There's a lot of steps. Um, and in our county, there are less sort of clear timelines and benchmarks than in some other places. Um, and what we often see is that the structure gets put in and then a multi-year project or process happens. And then at the end of just sort of going in the after the fact process, it often authorizes the impact to remain. Um, but I will say again, and I noticed it, noted this at the beginning that we are seeing some changes with that and we are seeing more, um, what I would say kind of stronger enforcement where some of these structures are, are being made to either come all the way out or get much smaller or be redesigned. Um, but really the, the bottom line here, right, is that this lack of compliance is limiting the effectiveness of all our other programs. You know, we did this long shoreline master program update and all these great changes got made so that we can really make sure that only the really necessary armor goes in, right? Um, and that our voluntary programs, we've got shore friendly programs and we've got grant funding to help people take out armor and design alternatives and all these great things. It's huge engine of an incredible amount of resources going into that. Um, however, the actual effect on the ground, right? The like, are we making progress towards our goal of improving habitat is limited by this large number of things that are happening totally outside of that system. And again, monitoring, better monitoring of what's happening on the ground is kind of the, the solution for that. So switching gears from the compliance um, piece and going to the management implications for folks that did come through the permit track, right? So there were, we had about a few, um, maybe 22, 23 county permits and about 20 um, state permits and all the actual details are in the report that I think Elise has sent us links to and um, with the sign up and she can pop in the host as well or into the um, chat as well. Um, but how is our permit process going, right? For that small number of people who do go the permit route, which is where we're supposed to address our cultural and environmental impacts and impacts to neighbors and all those kind of things. Um, again, we talked about um, mitigation. We didn't see too much, too many projects that were required to do mitigation. 
um, despite you know some of them being located lower on the beach or in priority areas. Um, we saw limited amounts of inspections. Um, again, everything's done on such a parcel by parcel scale, and that's again how the development process works, right? People have to apply for a permit. But again, periodically, we've got to sort of come up and, and look at what are the cumulative impacts and, and how do we connect that to sort of our policy. Um, one thing too, and we did do it during the pandemic, so I'm sure that was part of it, but it took um, nine or 10 months of extensive back and forth with the county and Fish and Wildlife to sort of get all what we hope is all the information about these permits, right? And, and that was a really long and laborious process. And I'm sure the public records folks on the other side also feel like that was a long and laborious process, but it was 100 sites and we only ended up with about 40 permits. So the fact that that actually took that long um, is sort of a clue that maybe the systems that we're using to track our permits and track and maintain our permit information um, are not totally up to snuff, right, um, for ev everybody. Um, and that's just a public access thing that will help if we can improve our permit systems, that will help the staff at the state and the county do their job more effectively and efficiently and have access to the information they need. Another key piece um, really is these implementing project inspections. I was part of the SAMON initiative, folks who've been around here, that was done in 2007 and eight, different project, looked at a bunch of dock and armor permits, went back out, found that everybody was sort of building bigger, wider, lower on the beach, all those things sort of, again, lack of kind of follow-up inspections and there was a little push there for like a year to start doing inspections and then that changed to people having to submit photos but in the permit record there's even very very few of the actual photos of sort of what was there before and what was after so better tracking of on the ground conditions but also just better tracking of what happens what happens if we put all these conditions in a permit did those get followed how did it go and again a bottom one here is just sort of really working on the capacity of the regulator, the regulators to really review these applications critically. Like I said, no net loss is always a finding. Grant made the great point of, of course, they're required to come to that finding, but like sort of, can you follow the dots that get you to that finding? And was that appropriate? Um, we really need to make sure that our um, regulators have the resources they need or access to the resources they need. Everybody's not a geologist. Everybody's not an engineer. Um, but let's make sure these people are resources so that they can really make an accurate decision. You know, as I talked about earlier, our permit process is cumbersome and complex. And it is that way because it's designed to try to sort of meet the needs of the homeowner or the developer and protect the resource, right? But if we're not getting that protection of the resource, then why have it be so complicated and expensive and long, right? So if it's gonna be hard, Let's make sure we're getting that public benefit out of the end. Do not try to read this slide. It's just totally insane. But what I wanted to point out across the top, all in yellow, are all these other studies that have been done around Puget Sound, looking at regulatory effectiveness. And down on the side um, of the sort of the rows, sort of all kind of some of these common themes of you know, were people getting permits? Do site inspections happen? Are agencies coordinating together? Are we mapping underground conditions or on the ground conditions? And so there's sort of this consistent body of evidence now across our region that really says, this is a piece we've got to work on. We've spent the last 20 years throwing billions of dollars at restoration, right? We've got to start getting this protection piece to work if we want to get to net gain. So that's the sum of that slide is that Lots of other studies say basically the same thing. And then what can we do, right? So again, the goal of this is to provide objective information and really give us the like, okay, where do we need to tweak here? Where do governments, local governments need better information, right? Is there a state mapping program that could happen that could then feed that information to all the counties? So groups like ours don't have to sort of go out and do it and everyone does it themselves at a different time, right? Let's get some consistent tracking going. Um, and again, I just want to say again that we're not against all armor. In some cases, you need it. But in so many cases, we see it. The house is 150 feet back, and it's a landscape feature. Or it was built without 
any design standard. So it takes up 20 feet of the beach instead of the five that it might take if it was properly engineered. There's sort of a whole host um, and there's alternatives. There's soft shore projects. There's a whole host of sort of things in between a big pile of rock um, and a completely wild shoreline, right? Um, and I do just wanna make a little plug for sort of the voluntary side of this, right? Um, so there's regulations, but then there's also technical assistance programs. Um, so here in San Juan County, Friends of the San Juans is our shore friendly provider. Um, that's a state program that provides free technical assistance to shoreline owners um, and help you decide, right? Do you need a bulkhead? Would something else work? Or is it not wave induced erosion at all? Lots of times we see people have either they've removed all the vegetation or they have a big upland drainage problem. There's too much water and the way we're seeing water come down these days, that can be a real problem. I wanna kind of pause again, if anybody has questions, thoughts, let me just peek in the chat. Yeah, we had another good question from Tyler. Do we have an idea of breakdown of who is doing the arm armoring? For example, landowners themselves compared to contractors? Yeah, that's a great question. And one that the managers are definitely asking. Um, and that's sort of where we're, that's a great sort of segue to this next point of sort of where we are now with this data, right? So I'm talking about the trends and the big picture and all the data together. And what I'm doing now is really going through sort of all the individual sites that roughly 75 places where armor was put in in the last 10 years without a permit. And we're sort of prioritizing in terms of um, what's the environmental impact, how big it is it, and it, some of them are very obviously done by contractors, right? Because it, there's just, you need an excavator and some even probably required a barge. And some are like the home jobs, right? Where people are rearranging. We see those gabion baskets that people do the wire and you can fill that with small rock. And um, so it is, it is a wide range. Um, we have some folks from the county on here and the state, and I know they're both really interested and in really kind of trying to target. So if there's a few bad apple kind of contractors out there, like let's really work with that, um, focusing on that and, and sort of trying to, again, solve the problem in a systemic way versus sort of this parcel by parcel piece. But yeah, great question. Um, so I don't have a super straight off, you know, answer for that. And we don't know for sure, but again, we are doing kind of a, a more detailed look and from those photos it, it's pretty clear that some of them you know were professionally installed with large equipment and then my guess would be for those that they were done with contractors thanks tina another question from ryan what sort of local interagency collaborations are you looking forward to specifically thinking about neighboring counties whatcom Skag skagit etc yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I haven't actually really thought about that. We have, so this work was supported through our San Juan County Local Integrating Organization, funded through the Puget Sound Partnership, and I'm at my funding slide, and, um, and the Environmental Protection Agency. And there has been work done um, by WFW over Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife over in Hood Canal. Um, King County's done some of this work. You know, what I would really like to see instead of sort of individual counties each doing a mapping and that sort of thing is that we could get some state agency leadership, whether it's the partnership or ecology or something and use some of this new technology like great imagery and do more of a sound wide look again of we've got to get that on the ground information. If, if people don't have the on the ground information, you know, I, I mean, you can't expect our county enforcement officer to go enforce on something he doesn't know about, right? So we have to actually create that data set. Um, and again, instead of creating it county by county, that would be a great benefit, I think. And we could use it for other things, right? It could inform the regulatory program, but it could also inform all of the voluntary programs where we provide technical assistance, cost share for alternatives, cost share for updates. Um, so I guess at this point, it's sort of sharing that this, data is out there um, and we have done like some webinars through the partnership and things but I guess at counties it would be great to see sort of counties or, or communities come together and and really advocate I guess for better on the ground data and maybe more resources too right for enforcement um, that's a political will thing right nobody likes it it's icky it's not fun work um, but I feel like that the results really are showing you know we are so busy 
trying to recover, you know, our shorelines and our marine food webs in support of our endangered salmon and support of our critically endangered southern resident orca. Um, and so we just have to do a better job cracking this protection net, even if it's hard. Thanks, Tina. Another great question from Tyler. What kind of incentives are available or could be introduced for shoreline owners who maintain a natural state? Conversely, what penalties are there or could be introduced for those who don't? Yeah, great question, Tyler. So there are a whole suite of things. Um, I mentioned the shore friendly program, right? So that, that already is sort of one form of an incentive program um, across Puget Sound. Um, including here in San Juan County. So homeowners, waterfront owners can get help with um, sort of information on their shorelines. And then if they are working on either a armor removal, habitat restoration, or in many cases, even doing soft shore or an alternative to a hard armor, um, there are grant programs, cost share programs for vegetation, cost share programs for dealing with runoff, um, actual grants to help people just pay for, um, you know, the vast majority of projects that Friends of the San Juans are restoration projects. We work sometimes with public um, entities. We've worked with state parks and the county and the Tulalip tribes, but the vast majority of our project work is on private property and we get grant funding to do that work. Um, I, years ago, back, um, I don't even remember what, maybe the last comp plan update, <laughs> uh, we were trying to get people to actually get like tax benefits for maintaining their feeder bluff, right? If that's providing a public value, then we should be thinking about valuing that to that, to that property owner. Um, there's also the Preservation Trust and the Land Bank. We've worked with a lot on sort of helping identify where those priority places are and they do conservation easements um, and in some cases acquisition, but conservation easements are a tool where the private property owner keeps their property and sort of agrees to leave the shoreline intact, right? No bulkheads, no docks, keep the vegetation. Um, and then they actually are um, either donate or sometimes or they even purchase the value of that conservation easement on that section of the property for giving up the development of that property. It doesn't mean that you're giving up having a house. It just means that that shoreline section of the property is staying functional. So that's an existing tool that's out there. Um, and then I think, you know, those are all the carrots. And I think, unfortunately, we've got to get a little better about the stick because if there's so many of these that are just sliding through without ever being involved in enforcement at all, there's very little incentive for people to enter, in my opinion, a multi-year tens of thousands of dollar permit process, right? If six out of 75 enter the enforcement process, there's just no incentive to, to doing the right thing right now. So unfortunately, and that's not the fun part again, um, so you need the carrots, but there also does have to be sort of this firm consequences for doing things the wrong way um, to really push people into those incentive programs. All righty. Any other questions? I'd love to, I might actually just take my, I'd be happy to kind of stay and have more of a discussion or questions for the next couple of minutes. I'm gonna pop myself off of um, sharing my screen. Randall shared that beyond shore friendly, there's also larger grants to help remove unnecessary shoreline armoring. Most folks don't know that the SRFB or ESRP funding may actually help a property owner accomplish the goal of a large scale shoreline restoration. And this can be done through a sponsor such as Friends of the San Juans or the Northwest Straits Foundation. Yeah, yeah, great point. So there's sort of the technical assistance piece, but there is, and again, most, the vast majority of the projects we do are with private landowners. Um, and, you know, we come in, not only do we provide financial assistance through these grant programs, we're also hiring the consultants, managing all the permitting, managing the implementation contracts, right? So it's not just sort of um, a little bit of advice, right? It's actually kind of a, a full meal deal, especially for armor removal. Um, but there are also, you know, financial resources available to do things sort of in a, a more environmentally friendly way. Uh, and one thing I for forgot to mention that I think is really important. Um, so I've done shoreline side visits with, I don't know, probably 300 different waterfront property owners in the San Juans over the last two decades. And I just want to say, despite people always wanting to be able to build really close, 
you are not doing people any favors. We as a society are not doing people any favors, letting them scooch way up to a sediment supply bluff or way up to the marine near shore in a really low environment. Climate is changing. People are flooding. People are, you know, we're talking to people now who are facing $600,000 house relocations because they could spend $300,000 on a bulkhead, but that's not going to work, right? So we do some of our sort of prevention, the sort of how do we reduce the demand, right? Let's make it so people people don't want to go spend $100,000 on a bulkhead or $50,000 or $20,000 or even build one themselves. They're worried about erosion, right? Or they're worried about flooding. Let's help people and help, you know, do a better job of not putting this development in these inappropriate places in the first place better for the habitat and it is better for these landowners. People are experiencing a, a large amount of sort of stress and financial concern right now. And it's mostly because of this legacy of a lot of buildings that are not in an appropriate spot at all. That's my soapbox for protection. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tina. Um, I just wanted to give a final thank you to everybody that attended. Um, and you are more than welcome to stay on if you have additional questions and you can post them in chat or you can unmute yourself and share your video if you'd like and ask questions. And I just posted in chat a link to our e-news sign up as uh, Tina's research evolves as well as other research and events through Friends of San Juan's. Getting on our monthly e-news is a great place to get updates on all of that. Uh, and thank you so much for coming and please chime in if you have additional questions or thoughts. Yeah, thanks everybody. I really appreciate your time. And I know many of you and I know a lot of you are working on these issues. So thank you for your work.